You are listening to the Freight Buyers Club, a home for those interested in international trade, shipping, procurement, logistics, and air freight. In fact, all things supply chain in the Americas, Asia, and beyond. This podcast is brought to you by your host, Mike King, and produced in partnership with Demurco Express Group, a global 3PL that specializes in managing logistics to, from, and within the Asia Pacific region. Hello everybody, I'm Mike King and this is the Freight Buyers Club, produced in partnership with Demirco Express Group. We're available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Please follow and subscribe. You'll also find all episodes at www.thefreightbuyersclub.com where you can subscribe to receive each episode direct to your inbox. I'm sure no one needs me to tell them that the world is a rather battered and I'd say confusing place at the moment. Everywhere, conflict seems to be on the rise. If you think war and COVID isn't enough, the world of trade has been shocked by attacks on shipping in the Red Sea and a container vessel tragically taking out a major bridge in Baltimore. Our thoughts are, of course, with the families of those who lost their lives. It might only be the fifth largest box port on the US East Coast, but that doesn't mean that thousands of shippers haven't been caught in the fallout. Many shippers might be facing losses given the relatively low uptake of insurance to cover cargo losses on container ships, depending on how that insurance case plans out. But today, I'd like to take a look beyond what is happening right now to global supply chains and try and put this into some sort of long-term context with a view to helping you all plan ahead for what you might have coming down the pipeline at you in the years ahead. And I've got the perfect person with whom to explore some of these things. Mark Levinson is an economist, historian, and journalist with a long track record of writing and speaking about economic and business issues, especially globalization. And he has a relatively new book out, which is well worth a read, called Outside the Box. He's also the author of the widely read The Box, which really is the definitive story of the container and its role in global trade and indeed globalization. Mark, welcome to the Freight Buyers Club. Well, thanks. It's great to be with you, Mike. Mark, before we get into some of your views on long-term trade and what it means for importers, exporters, carriers, and everybody else in the transport ecosystem, let's just think about where we are right now. We spoke in the second quarter of 2023 about a more fractured world and what it means for globalization. And I didn't think even just that short period of time ago that events could really take a turn for the worse to the extent that they have given what was going on already in the Black Sea. But that seems to be where we are now. Uh, just looking at the geopolitical situation in the Middle East, this battle over control of the Red Sea and the Suez Canal and the complex politics and, and violence of all of that, what are your thoughts? It's clear that uh, there's been a lot of disruption in international trade. Actually, the volume of trade internationally has remained reasonably strong, which is, uh, I think, a bit of a surprise given all that's gone on and, and is somewhat of a testimony to the resilience of value chains around the world. But clearly, uh, we're seeing more regional trade. We're seeing more disputes among uh, trading partners that are, are likely to inhibit uh, the flow of trade going forward. It seems that the United States and, and China have a hard time finding anything good to say about one another right at this stage. And obviously, we've got the, the Russia situation. Uh, we've got you know, all kinds of great disagreements going on uh, related to the Gaza war in, in Israel. And um, so I think we're seeing in general quite a lot of trade frictions around the world, and, and those are definitely getting in the way of, of the growth of trade. Is this changing how you look at long-term global logistics uh, and that shipping landscape at all? The only thing that has changed, I think, is that we're seeing uh, even greater political risk uh, at this point in time. You're seeing a lot of mudslinging uh, from among governments, uh, there are tit-for-tat retaliation over things that don't really seem all that important in the, the greater scheme of things. So we're seeing that a lot of governments seem to be losing faith in, in the multilateral trading system and erecting barriers and starting to cut special deals with one another. And that's going to uh, continue to, to uh, damp the growth of trade. I'll come back to the minutiae of some of those trends in, in a moment. But, but prior to arranging this interview, we were exchanging views on Angus Deaton, who's the Dwight Eisenhower, Professor of Economics and International Affairs at Princeton and the 2015 recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. 
writing for the International Monetary Fund, he basically reversed his previously relatively consensus position on a bunch of stuff, but most notably the benefits of globalization, which is obviously your area of expertise as well. Now, Dayton, he said he'd become skeptical about many of the benefits, such as the reduction of global poverty that we tend to think of when we think of free trade and globalization. You said you agreed with parts of, of this Damascene conversion, as someone called it. Before we jump into some of the practicalities and implications of your views on long held views on, on free trade, please do explain which bits of globalization you think are positive or perhaps where you agree with Dayton as has globalization gone too far, maybe? Well, first, I need to confess that uh, once upon a time, many decades ago, uh, Angus Deaton attempted to teach me economics. So um, I, I do have a, a bit of a soft spot, despite my failure to learn very much from him. I do agree in general with the view that globalization uh, went a bit overboard. Uh, part of my argument in, in my book, Outside the Box, is that international trade was actually quite highly subsidized in a variety of ways. And this led to a trade growing faster than it should have just for economic reasons alone. Uh, these subsidies took and still take many, many forms from subsidized uh, ships and shipping to the uh, environmental damage caused by manufacturing in some countries, which manufacturers are allowed to, to do, which is effectively a subsidy because the manufacturers don't bear the cost of, of cleaning up their pollution. There are, uh, to, to the fact that there's increasingly cash paid to manufacturers to settle and build a plant here and, and export a lot of use of, of various trade measures to promote exporting. So I think these things led really to an excess of a trade in the great era of globalization. I think some of that may now be dialed back a bit. Uh, that said, I do have a, a concern about uh, one of the things that Professor Deaton has said, and that is to cast doubt on whether uh, globalization has been good for workers in, in poor countries. There are Definitely a lot of workers in poor countries who haven't benefited from globalization. But there are an awful lot of people who have. We've got billions of people who've really been able to climb out of poverty around the world over the last 30 years or so. And that's absolutely due to the very rapid growth in international trade. And so uh, I think that while there are definitely some problems in globalization, there have also been some very significant benefits from it. I think we'll come back to the politics of this, but obviously one of his main points was that the it, it's the workers in the rich world that have, have sometimes lost out and, that, and that's why people are, are in some cases are turning against, well, putting up barriers, protectionist barriers, isn't it? No, that's true. And there are definitely workers in the rich world that have lost out. And there are some workers in the poor world that have lost out. There are definitely workers who are, are worse off or farmers who are worse off. There are definitely people who've been exploited. But uh, when you take a look at the research that's been done in terms of the number of people trying to live on you know, $2 a day, that's really gone down. Despite the fact that there's a lot of poverty in a lot of places, most people around the world now have a decent diets, for example. They're able to afford goods that they couldn't have imagined uh, having in their own possession 30 or 40 years ago. And and these are signs of, of an improved living standard. Life expectancy in many, particularly poorer countries, is, is growing longer. Health care is getting better. Education levels are getting higher. And some of this is related to globalization. So I think we, we just need to be careful when we're uh, engaging in the criticism to recognize that while there are a lot of things wrong, there are also a good number of things that uh, have gone in a very positive direction. Okay, let's uh, rewind slightly to some of your long-term thinking on these topics. You've stated previously that trade as a share of the global economy peaked in 2008. Can you put some meat on the bones of that for me, please? In terms of the, the percentage of uh, exports as a share of global GDP peaked in 2008, and they have gotten up close to that level in the just coming out of the COVID pandemic, 
but they, they have not yet surpassed it. And there seems to be enough weakness now in global manufacturing that perhaps they're not going to pass it after all. We've seen that a lot of countries are experiencing, just based on the data, more domestic value added in their own economies and less imported value added. That's one clue to what's going on. Uh, as countries, not just the United States and China, are attempting to have more of the manufacturing work uh, done domestically. So and we're also seeing that international uh, direct investment, that's when a company owns a business in another country, that also uh, has been historically weak. That peaked globally in 2007, the share of GDP. And the growth of international trade was very much tied into the growth of foreign direct investment as companies set up subsidiaries in, in other countries. So I don't think that we really have any reason to expect that there's going to be strong growth in international trade. I'm, I'm not saying by any stretch that trade's going away. But I expect that it's going to grow more slowly than the world economy over the coming years. Is this part of the nature of trade changing? As in, instead of trading goods and products, we're trading services instead to an increasing degree? We're trading services to an increasing degree. And a lot of this really is not well measured and probably isn't going to be well measured for reasons that have to do with the concept of, of what it is to trade things. When we measure trade, we're measuring transactions. And a lot of the services that move are actually digits, often moving within companies uh, from one country to another. And these don't register as trade transactions at all, but, but they're increasingly important. We're seeing just a lot of trends that point to slower growth in trade. For example, uh, in the United States, which I think probably has the best data on this, about 42% of business investment last year was in intangibles. Okay? I'm talking about the category that used to be known as plant and equipment. And now plant and equipment is barely half of business investment. Most of a very large share of business investment now is software, research and development, sorts of things that don't move in container ships. And that's only going to grow. And this has consequences for freight transportation, because if you've got a machine that's five years old, you don't need to toss it out. You can replace the software and keep the machine you've got for a longer period. And we see evidence that companies are doing exactly this. So that's likely to limit the growth of international trade. There are a number of other factors too, but certainly the growth of trade and services is an important one. Mark, in your books, you point out that trade is evolving in a variety of ways that might affect the volume of that trade. One of them being that products are getting smaller or which means that in some cases they don't need to be shipped. This is miniaturization. It's 3D printing. It's the fact that electric cars need less parts. Can you give us a bit more detail on, on this, please? Sure. I think everybody has experienced the fact that almost anything you buy now might have some sort of semiconductor device in it. Uh, which may be replacing a lot of parts and components that used to be attached to it. Many goods are, are now simpler to manufacture because they have fewer parts. And remember, each of those parts used to be traded. Each of those parts used to be shipped somewhere. Uh, we're, we're seeing this in not just in the automotive sector, where obviously electric vehicles are, are a big uh, source of the slowing growth in trade because electric vehicles do use thousands fewer parts than internal combustion vehicle. We're seeing this in, in many other types of products. On the one hand, I suppose that's good because it reduces the cost of manufacturing, makes things more affordable to people, uh, all of that. But on the other hand, there are a lot of things that just are not going to need to be shipped around the world in as much quantity as has been the case. So if less manufactured goods are going to be shipped in the future, what sort of growth rate in trade in relation to GDP growth are you expecting or, or should we all expect? My own expectation would be that the international manufacturers trade grows quite slowly. We're talking about probably a percentage point or two slower than the growth in international GDP. Uh, again, stuff isn't going away. Um, you know, we're not going back to... Uh, living in caves, but I think that the growth in demand for manufactured goods is are going to be sluggish. 
and uh, that's really going to be reflected in the flow of trade. You can see this in some trends that people in the logistics industry don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to. One is um, take the, the data for housing starts. They're not available for every country around the world. But in general, a housing construction in many parts of the world, including uh, the United States, uh, Europe, Japan, China, Korea, housing construction has not been very robust. Housing construction is a big driver of consumer spending. When people have a house, they buy stuff to put in it. So if, if there's not a lot of housing being built, that's really going to damp the growth of trade. Um, more generally, the demographic factors here are really uh, overwhelming. Uh, the world's population is now growing quite slowly. We have a lot of countries where the population is aging. Many countries where the population is, median age of the population is getting close to 50 years. And older people buy a lot of services. They don't buy so many goods. So I think these are, are factors that are really going to keep way on the growth of, of goods trade, keep it growing fairly slowly. And of course, demographics also dictates to a certain degree where things are built as well, which we'll come back to. Just in terms of how we view the modern world, just thinking about technology, um, and I was, I was pondering the 2002 movie Minority Report, which starred Tom Cruise. It, it depicted a future world in, in 2054 that was so scientifically advanced it was possible to predict crimes before they happened. I'm sure you remember it. They got all these global experts together to predict what technology would be like in the future. And this is things like predictive analytics, touchscreens, wearable technology, augmented reality, autonomous vehicles. Ten years later, obviously, all these things were already in use, not only in society, but in, in transport and logistics. Is there technology out there that you've identified that you think could speed some of these trends up that would then therefore perhaps slow trade growth down, if you see where I'm going with this? Certainly, a lot of the technology that's going to affect the growth of trade is the technology that makes individual devices work. We've already seen a lot of that, but I think that there's more coming. And so we see that in the pretty robust trade in electronic devices, semiconductors and, and things like that, which are in many cases taking the place of things that were put in product. Uh, and, and we're not just talking here about vacuum tubes and, and things like that, but you now have a huge number of toys and games and, and electrical devices and household equipment and so forth that use semiconductors to do jobs that used to be done by parts, physical parts that needed to be moved. And, and so that trade is not so strong anymore. How this is going to affect the flow of trade in the future, uh, I can't really guess, but I think that we're very accustomed to living in a different sort of way now. I'm sitting here talking to you uh, on a computer. Well, I often use that computer for other purposes. It can function as a telephone. It can function as a camera. It can function as a television set. And so that's a lot of stuff that I don't need to have anymore. And that's really affecting the, the demand for goods. All good points. If this is where the world's going, Mark, how should 3PLs, brokers, shipping lines, freighter operators, you name it, everyone who relies on the international business of trade, how should they prepare for this? Do we, do we need less wide body freighters if trade growth is perhaps going to be more regional in the future? Do we really need these 20,000 TEU container ships for long haul trade, or at least in the numbers that we, we seem like we're going to have them? I'm not a huge fan of these Megamax ships. Uh, I think that they don't provide a lot of benefits to many of the companies that have put them to use. And I think they have a lot of disadvantages. My hunch is that the reason that a number of ship lines have purchased these 25,000 TEU ships or something close to that is that governments in various countries have an interest in having them manufactured because they use a lot of steel. They're going to keep a lot of industrial workers employed in making the stuff for these ships. But I don't think that these enormous vessels are really so practical, aside from the fact that they don't really seem to have the economies of scale that were promised. We've seen that, that they really lack flexibility in the face of a changing world economy. And they're, they're definitely fouling up trade. It used to be that about 
10% of container ships were running behind schedule. Now I've heard estimates of 30 and 40% of container ship voyages are behind schedule. And that's in part due to the complexity of discharging and, and reloading of these enormous vessels. And I think we need to take a look at the changes in trade patterns. The, the average distance of international trade is coming shorter. I think the reasons for this are, are obvious. Uh, some trade is uh, regionalizing. In other cases, you've got uh, a lot of trade growth in new countries where the distance to trading partners is relatively short. So you might want a 25,000 TEU ship to carry freight between Shanghai and, and Rotterdam. But is it really the most efficient way to carry freight between Shanghai and uh, Mumbai uh, or uh, Singapore or Indonesia or places where you're now seeing substantial industrial growth? In those cases, I think the time required to deal with these giant ships in port will outweigh any advantages that may come from the size of the, the vessel. So I, I think that the, the Megamax ships are probably the wrong vessel for that purpose. Yeah, just on that schedule reliability, I think the, the most recent data I had was either for January or February, and glo average global schedule reliability was down to just over 50%. Obviously, it's dropped a bit in the, in the wake of the Red Sea crisis, but it wasn't that much higher anyway. So, I mean, that, that probably answers part of your the points that you made there about whether these ships are efficient. We have actually got something interesting on the horizon. It's the it's the Gemini cooperation between Maersk and Hapag Lloyd, where they're promising is it ninety percent reliability, you reinventing the hub and spoke system to try and get the best out of of all these ships. So we'll I think it'll be watch that particular space in early twenty twenty five when that starts operating and see whether that's possible. Do you think on just on box shipping still, do you think that these companies, maybe they're hedging their bets by investing in logistics footprint because they're not quite sure where the, where the economics of the vessel operations are going. We've seen some investing in, in air cargo operations. They're investing heavily in ports. They've got feeder operators. It's the full supply chain for some of, some of the carriers, at least. Yes. I have a question about whether or not this is going to work out for a couple of reasons. One is that it simply requires a, a different skill set, a different approach to business to be involved in, in freight forwarding or be a 3PL or, or something like that than to be a, a ship line. And I'm not sure that companies whose heritage is in being ship lines uh, are necessarily ready to do all of these other things. But I think there's also a question about the extent to which companies are going to be prepared to do business with their competitors. If you're running a, a ship line and you also have a freight forwarding operation, is your freight forwarder really going to want to do business with a competitor to your ship line? That might be in customer's interest, but it might not be in the corporate interest. And there's going to be an uncomfortable period out here, I think, where while the various companies engaged in the shipping business feel this out, I would not be shocked to find that some companies don't really want to do business with their competitors. There's an element of cannibalism, I think someone put to me as well, where some of them have been accused of eating their own customer base. But we'll just take a short break. We'll be back with you in a second. This podcast is proudly produced in partnership with DeMurco Express Group, a trusted provider of global shipping and contract logistics services in Asia, Europe, and North America. DeMurco's particular strength is in Asia, where it gives shippers the freight capacity and local market expertise to streamline freight movements to and from the region, particularly for trans-Pacific lanes. With 130 forwarding and logistics locations across China, India, and Southeast Asia, DeMurco connects Asia with the world like no other global 3PL. You are listening to the Freight Buyers Club. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at something slightly different. Can I pivot back to supply chains and geopolitics? We've seen some stories suggesting that China and Russia might do a deal with the Houthis to ensure safe passage through the Red Sea. It raises the, I mean, whether it's possible given the reliability of Houthi attacks, there's been attacks since that announcement on Chinese vessels anyway. But uh, it does raise the idea of that, raises the specter of Chinese shipping and traders potentially gaining market advantage. What's your view on China's approach to the Red Sea crisis and perhaps how it thinks of 
free trade or freedom of the seas even? I think China is actually pretty worried about the Red Sea crisis since a lot of the vessels that were using the Red Sea were coming to and from China. It's really critical for China to be perceived as a reliable uh, source of goods and uh, as a reliable market for goods. And if the goods can't get to and from China on schedule, then, then that's a problem for the Chinese economy. So I think that they have to be involved in what's going on in, in the Red Sea and uh, on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, I think that you see them treading very carefully. They don't want to be perceived as strongly interventionist, which I'm sure is how they would characterize the United States or, or the UK in those circumstances. But they do want to be perceived as trying to keep trade open and, and flowing. And so they've got to do a bit of a diplomatic dance here. What does, at least the perception of what China is, how China is acting, what does this mean towards relations with the West where China's key markets are? What does it mean for Chinese manufacturing and uh, manufacturing and exports? Does this mean people are increasingly looking away from China? We've discussed this slightly before about how easy it is to get into China, how safe it is. There's, there's been a, a real change over the last few years under Xi, hasn't there? I think the Chinese have done a lot of damage to themselves economically. And it's not over. I mean, now they've announced a big campaign to strengthen manufacturing. The, the whole world is now on edge. Uh, there's an awareness that China has this enormous manufacturing capacity, far more than it needs for any domestic purpose, and that it may well be pumping goods into the international market that create excess supply and drive down prices for many products around the world. And you're seeing many countries now talk about uh, how to resist this. Who would have expected to see Brazil discussing trade sanctions on China. Brazil and China were buddy-buddy just a couple of years ago. And I think that this reflects some, some rather clumsy diplomacy on the part of China and, and some uh, unwise policies on the part of China. Where this goes, I don't know, but at the moment it's leading to new trade barriers being erected, and, and that's going to be bad for low of trade. If those barriers are erected against China, does someone else win in terms of where that manufacturing goes? If new barriers are erected against China, it's going to depend on what those barriers look like. For example, I think the world is, is now quite aware that many of the previous barriers that have been imposed on China have simply led to trade being, uh, the barriers being circumvented as a Chinese companies open up shop in other countries or Chinese suppliers find customers in other countries, which then export to the countries that are, have imposed trade barriers on China. So there's a lot of circumvention going on. A lot of governments are concerned about how to crack down on uh, Chinese components in other countries' exports. And, and this goes beyond the shipping industry. I mean, we're seeing, going to see this here in, in North America. There's a lot of uh, Chinese interest in industrial sites in Mexico because Mexico has a free trade agreement with the United States. Uh, we're already seeing a backlash and the first exports from these Chinese industrial sites haven't even occurred yet. But there's a lot of talk about what do we do to make sure that goods that come into the United States from Mexico have a lot of Mexican content and are not basically Chinese goods that are simply assembled in Mexico. This is all having to do with the rules of origin and international trade. And I think the situation is, is going to get worse rather than better. Trade is going to get more and more complicated because of more and more government regulation. Uh, there's some genuine fears about the origin of goods as well, or the technology and who's in control of it. I'll throw another movie at you, actually. I saw a uh, Netflix's Leave the World Behind not so long ago. And apart from taking a massive swing at Elon Musk Tesla, it raised some of these fears about what happens if transportation could be hijacked. This is actually, this is, there's granular detail to this as well. There's a lot of, there's a big debate about the technology in cranes. I mean, this has been going on for a while. If they could be used to spy on what's happening, um, whether they could be shut down if tensions escalated. We've got US legislators claiming that the, the use of the Shanghai containerized freight index might confer a competitive advantages 
on Chinese businesses. Is all of this overblown, do you think? Is this ramping up political rhetoric or is this some of this genuine? I think a lot of it is overblown. We're seeing a situation in the United States now similar to uh, what went on back in Cold War days with, with Russia, where nobody was ever going to say anything nice about Russia because there was no political advantage in doing that. So now we're seeing a lot of politicians piling on with respect to China. Uh, I think there's some real problems, some real security issues raised by trade with China. But I think a number of the things that have been raised publicly may not be security issues, may simply be a, an excuse for a protection. You've seen that, for example, of some U.S. labor unions are contending that the Chinese subsidies for ships are destroyed the U.S. Uh, shipbuilding business. Well, the U.S. shipbuilding business has been in a not very good state for many decades. And we, we dealt with German subsidies and Japanese subsidies and Korean subsidies and many other countries' subsidies. And this isn't just a China problem. This really is a problem that has to do a lot with U.S. policy. So I think that you know, there's overkill here. It would be very helpful if more information were being made available publicly. With respect to the cranes, for example, I think that there's a very good question being asked. Do, do the, the electronic systems in these cranes allow somebody in Beijing to make them stop functioning, which is what's been alleged? Uh, could China remotely close down U.S. container ports by disabling the cranes? I don't know the answer to that. If someone in Washington thinks that the answer is yes, I'd like to see some explanation as to exactly how that would happen. Uh, at this point, we've mostly gotten accusations without enough information that someone can judge whether the accusations actually make any sense. Yeah, I agree. China's becoming a bit of a convenient scapegoat for a lot of interest groups, and some of it is quite hysterical. I saw someone referencing the vessel crashing in into the Baltimore Bridge the other day and saying, oh, it was, it was a deliberate act of war by China. And I was like, how did you get to that? How did you get to that conclusion, you know, with the lack of information out there? I mean, it, it's so, so far-fetched, especially as I've, I know one of the, some of the companies involved quite well, and I'm pretty sure that would be impossible. But I, I guess that shows where the debate is going. But what does this sort of, let's call it the diminishment of post-World War II order, or I don't know, is this a, a return to mercantilism? What's this new global future looking like in your view? I, I mean, and maybe more precisely, what does it mean for U.S. manufacturers and, and shippers? I think mercantilism is probably a bit strong, but we're, we're definitely moving to trade in some parts of the economy being much more much more driven by governments. It's useful to remind people that a lot of international trade is not really being affected by this at all. Some of the biggest U.S. imports from China, for example, are furniture or toys. Hey, we're not seeing much mercantilistic behavior when it comes to trading in, in beds and tables. Okay, so it's in some segments of, of the economy and not others. And probably it's affecting a minority of international goods trade at this point in time. But uh, I think it's, it's a serious issue and it does create more risks for uh, shippers. I think one thing that we're seeing in this environment is that the increase in regulation of international trade weighs much more heavily on small companies than big ones. And so it's somewhat going to change the equation in terms of who participates in trade. If you're a giant company, you've got a whole staff of compliance people. Okay? They can help you find the best way around the trade barriers. They can make sure that you're in compliance with this rule or that rule that has just been imposed. And they can keep your goods flowing. If you're a tiny manufacturer, you can't do any of this stuff. You don't have that kind of staff. You can't afford that sort of expertise. And so perhaps you've got a freight forwarder who can do it for you, but perhaps you're just going to be knocked out of international trade because it's just uh, too difficult for you to manage. And, and that's the concern. 
uh, is international trade going to become the province of just giant corporations and all the smaller market participants here are going to be forced to the edges? I think there's clear examples of that in Europe post-Brexit. A lot of UK SME exporters have just been shut out of European markets because they haven't got the scale to manage the paperwork and they can't afford to have to pay a middleman. So as you say, it favours the larger larger producer. Economies of scale are always going to win when trade friction increases. We're just bringing you back to now, if we may, Mark, as we start wrapping things up. I was asking on um, my previous podcast about the threat of Trump tariffs. So former President Trump has threatened to impose a universal baseline tariff of 10% on all US imported goods and, and tariffs of more than 60% on imports of Chinese goods if he wins the election in November. He's also threatened imports of cars from Mexico with tariffs and a bunch of other stuff. And already we're seeing some shippers moving cargo early just in case this happens next year. Do these policies, in your view, chime with your ex-professor Angus Deaton? Or is this more about a misunderstanding of who pays for tariffs and what balances of trade mean for countries? I don't want to put words in Professor Deaton's mouth, but uh, I doubt he's going to be terribly enthusiastic about these tariffs. Uh, Robert Lighthizer, who was the trade representative under Trump when, when, you know, during the Trump presidency and was previously an attorney who represented a lot of steel companies uh, that were seeking trade protection, recently uh, published a, a book and has written a number of articles. And he basically advances the idea that there ought to be balance in goods trade. This is uh, a really bad idea. Uh, there's some people who believe it. There's some people who believe that exports should be equal to imports, exports of goods should be equal to imports, and that anything less than this is economically harmful. And I think the economic case for that is extremely weak, but it's a good sell politically. And I think if uh, President Trump comes into office and, and brings Mr. Lighthizer with him, then there's going to be more pressure in this direction. I think we've seen a lot of people who have a bit more sophisticated understanding of the international economy who would say that, no, it's just not about getting a balance of goods trade. But there's definitely a movement in that direction and, and among some players in the political system. That's a threat. I think that's a threat to the growth of the trade. So that zero-sum approach then, what, how does that play out in your view? Uh, it could play out with tariffs. It can play out with quotas. It certainly could not play out with adherence to a World Trade Organization rules and with adherence to bilateral trade agreements, but any of those uh, could be renounced if um, a government wanted to do that. Uh, again, I don't see that most of the world is moving in quite so extreme a direction, but there definitely is some movement in that direction. This all impacts on efforts to improve the climate of the world, uh, the net zero emissions transition, whether they, we're talking about global transport and logistics industry or more generally, a lot of the materials and commodities that are required for that transition, they're not evenly distributed. I'm thinking copper, nickel, graphite, cobalt, rare earths. In this less global, more regionalized world where, where trade is less free, what does this mean for the have-nots in terms of these resources, particularly in places like Europe, which really doesn't have a lot of them? First off, I think we're going to see in the short term that some countries are at a disadvantage. I think this is actually going to, though, stimulate a lot of innovation. If, in fact, we've got some materials that are, are so critical and someone is trying to control their supply, that gives a great incentive to invent around them, to come up with alternative ways, whether it's alternative battery technologies or alternative semiconductor technologies or, or whatever it may be. So I tend to think that monopolies are really hard to sustain. And I think that there's good reason that even the producers of these goods would not want to create uh, monopolies because you're telling people to go off and, and find ways to break the monopoly. It's much more in their interest to keep uh, some trade flowing. I think that there will be countries that are uh, at a disadvantage and we will see some diplomacy, obviously, to deal with that, but this may affect where things are made in their country. Mark Levinson, it's been fascinating. Thanks for joining me today on the Freight Buyers Club. Great to be with you, mate.
We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Freight Buyers Club, produced in partnership with the DeMurco Express Group. Please subscribe and follow on your platform of choice or sign up for delivery to your inbox at thefreightbuyersclub.com. This podcast wouldn't have been possible without the fantastic editing of Karen Ball and Tom Matthews. And finally, thank you all for listening. The next episode will be with you soon.